Welcome everyone uh, to celebrate our Women's History Month. The Sue's the Women in Technology Network is excited to welcome you to our month-long inspiring speaker series called In Conversation With, and that would be inspiring speaker series even. And actually this is the fourth session that we're having and we've still got a couple more to go. Every month during this, every, I'll start again, every week during this month, We've been hosting In Conversation with Dialogues featuring a guest speaker who's been hosted by SUSE representative. And during our hour long sessions, they've been talking to us and giving us their journey of resilience, resolve, creativity, achievement, and basically unpacking how our guests are breaking the bias. Each session starts with the dialogue between the guest and the host, and then we follow that up with Q and A. To submit your questions, Take a look at the control panel. You'll see there's a question feed where you can submit your questions to me. I'll be your moderator today. I'm Jenny Newell Alexander, and I'm really, really excited to introduce our host today from SUSE. And that would be April Mo, our Chief Communications Officer, who I have the great pleasure to work with. April is the executive sponsor of SUSE's Women in Technology Network. And our special guest today is Wayne Moore, who's our Global Security Solutions Director for SUSE. He shares his personal story battling early onset Parkinson's disease and how he helps people with personal problems based off his own personal experience and how he has resigned, redesigned, sorry, his own life with adaptability at the forefront. And with that, it's my great pleasure to welcome April. Hey, Jenny. Thank you so much for the warm intro, Jenny. It's also my pleasure to, to have you on the team. So it's such an honor today to be hosting Wayne Mall. Um, Wayne has been with SUSE for about four years as the Global Security Solution Director. And Wayne brings a ton of experience to SUSE. He has over 27 years of tech industry experience. Um, and today, Wayne is our first male guest on our month-long public series to celebrate Women's History Month. Why Wayne? Well, because Wayne is a very much cherished ally and friend um, to the SUSE's Women in Tech Network. And Wayne has such an inspiring message to share about breaking the bias surrounding disabilities. I truly believe, I've spoken with Wayne multiple times in the lead up to this session. Um, I just truly believe that there is such a important message for all of us here today on the call. So thank you for joining us today. Before we begin our session, uh, let me start by playing a very short video that my team created um, for an internal event two years ago. This is Wayne's story. Um, let's roll the video. Hi, my name is Wayne Maw. I'm the US Channels Manager for SUSE. I have a wife and kids. My wife is Kelly, my daughters are Natalie and Haley, and I live in Duxbury, Massachusetts, which is on the South Shore. I was diagnosed with young onset Parkinson's in November of 2017. It was devastating for a very short amount of time. The family and I kind of bonded together and we said, you know what, the best way to do this is attack it head on. When I decided to attack it head on with my family, we decided that the best way for me to go about it is doing what I'm passionate about. And one of my biggest passions is cycling. I'm on the bike as often as I can be. It can either be cross racing, uh, mountain biking, or road riding for charity. So young onset Parkinson's is a neurological disease that basically will get worse over time. As you can see, I shake a little bit in my right side, in my right hand. Some days it's better than others. But the whole idea is to delay early onset Parkinson's or delay the Parkinson's onset. And the best way to do that is through exercise. I ride, I run, I surf, I do anything on a bike. And in two years, it has not progressed very much at all. For the most part, I don't let young onset Parkinson's interfere with my work or do anything. One of my passions is bringing awareness and teaching people and helping people get through their early diagnosis, which is often, as I said earlier, heartbreaking. One of my favorite speaking engagements was with my daughter's fourth grade class 
and my other daughter's sixth grade class. It was a very interesting presentation because the kids have no filter. They ask anything they want. And part of the fun of it was being able to answer any of their questions. When you meet a Parkinson's patient, every Parkinson's patient is different. The saying goes, if you've met one Parkinson's patient, you've met one Parkinson's patient. I said yes to being different because I am different. I shake. I shake in front of people. I shake trying to go to sleep. I shake brushing my teeth. And who needs an electric toothbrush when you, when you have Parkinson's disease? However, I attack this disease. I want to help people and I want to bring this to the forefront so we find a cure for this disease in my lifetime. Oh my goodness, Wayne. Every time I watch that video, I just I just love it. I love your story. I have I'm so honored that you are on the call with us today. And uh, thank you for making time. Thank you for making time and thank you for accepting the invitation to, to share your story um, you know, with the WIT Network and also with our um, our friends from outside the WIT Network today. Thank you, Welcome, April. Wayne. I appreciate it. I'm thrilled to be here. Awesome. And you know, we've had several conversations before, you know, just the session. And I will start with the first question for you, which, you know, came from an insight that you shared. Um, you said that you experienced your first symptoms at 28 years old and yep. were only officially diagnosed at 48. So that's a really long journey of 20 years of undiagnosed Parkinson's symptoms. What were those 20 years like for you? Frustrating <laughs> in many ways. Uh, so I started out the reason or what initiated the Parkinson's, I think, is I had nerve damage in my knee. And uh, so they used a pneumatic tourniquet on my knee. They reconstructed my knee. But when they did it, they had the pneumatic tourniquet too tight or something and they crush the femoral nerve that runs up my left leg and into my back and up into your brain. And they say that nerve trauma can induce some of this stuff. Well, that I believe is what happened to me. And when that happened, when they crushed the femoral nerve, it's a lot of nerve pain and things like that. So on top of that, when they did that, the doctors didn't know what was going on and they basically said, okay, you're in a lot of pain. It must be something screwed up in the knee. And uh, so they did more tests and everything else. They kept me on Percocet the whole time. And so I ended up uh, having issues with Percocets uh, and then, you know, different things started to happen after that. At one point, I just kind of put the bottle away and threw it all away and started over again and said, okay, how do I handle all this? And uh, what happened was I just kind of kept going. Things kept happening and I kept going to the doctor and they said, no, it's nothing. It's in your, it's in your head. And I'm, I know it's not in my head. <laughs> I'm familiar enough with how the human body works and how I work and everything like that to know that there was something wrong and just nobody could figure it out between the restless leg syndrome, which had kicked on immediately after, after, the, uh, after the nerve damage to stomach issues and things like that, that just kept happening and kept going on for years and years and years. And finally, I was sitting on the beach after uh, after we had just closed on a house here in Duxbury, the house that was in the video there. And uh, so I was sitting on the beach and all of a sudden my fingers started going, just, just one finger at that point. And I was like, hmm, that's strange. And my wife looked over and said, are you doing that on purpose? And I said, no. Nah. And we just chalked it up to stress because we had just closed on the house. I was just, uh, I had just left Cisco and was coming over to Sousa. And it was one of those things where it's like, okay, it's just a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
that's kind of how it went. And it was very frustrating to finally, it was actually relieving to get a diagnosis finally that gave me the ability to say, okay, now at least I know what I'm fighting. At least I know what I'm dealing with here. And that's kind of how things went. It was, like I said, very frustrating to start. But uh, now that I have a, a fight, I'm all in. Because <laughs> that's... This is amazing because this session is, you know, is it, going to focus so much on 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 just kind of the fight that you're you're on and 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 you know just what you're doing to 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 bring awareness to the disease. But for my education and for our audience's education, why do you think it took 20 years for for Parkinson's for your Parkinson's disease to be diagnosed? Uh, again, this is this is part of that bias, right? when we look at what a Parkinson's patient looks like in most people's head, mm -hmm. it's the old guy hunched over, shaking, walking with a cane, whatever it is. But that's not the case. Uh, the average diagnosis usually happens after the age of 60 with Parkinson's wow. disease. And when I, when I started having symptoms in my 20s, everybody looked at me and said, no, it, they never even considered Parkinson's. And until I started shaking, that's when they said, okay, now it's time to, I guess we need to really do whatever tests we can to determine if it actually is Parkinson's. And so it's been, it's been a journey. <laughs> Sounds like it really has been. And, and I'm glad that, you know, you just, uh, first of all, really Really sorry to hear about the 20 years, but so glad that finally there's a name for it and that you are tackling it with so much, just so much energy. Now you described in the video how heartbreaking early diagnosis can be. So I'm really curious to just kind of unpack this a little bit. Um, what was the turning point like for you from feeling so disempowered to finally feeling so empowered? How did you move past, you know, just no diagnosis to diagnosis to wanting to fight the disease? Uh, I basically came down to the fact that I want to be somebody that my girls can look up to or that can help people. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of what I really want to do out of all this is be able to make sure I'm helping people get through what I went through, but make it easier for them to, to give them the right tools to, to say, look, this is not the end of the world. This is not a, you're not going to die from this. This is going to be a problem and you need to work through it. But as we said, when we kick this off, this is about disabilities. I don't consider this a disability. It's an issue. It's something I got to deal with. A lot of people could consider it a disability, but it's not how I look at what I'm going through. It's There's a lot of biases around this. Like I said, it's the old guy hunched over. It's the person who can't uh, can't do things anymore or who's afraid to do things. And that's not what I want out of this disease. We have, there are Parkinson's patients who have participated in uh, the American Ninja Warrior. If you've ever watched that show, there's a guy named Jimmy Choi, who's actually now I've met several times and he and I have talked. And uh, there are incredible people out there with Parkinson's doing what I'm doing, trying to break the bias and make sure that people look at us and say, you know what? They're not the old guys. They're not doing this. They're in better shape than I am. They're doing more than I am. I need to get out there and do what I can to make sure I'm still around in 10, 15, 20 years. And I do everything from experiment with uh, different devices that can measure tremor, to try things that uh, 
can hopefully help this and beat trials and uh, move things along for other patients. That's really good. And, and you know, just I love how you have reframed this into just identifying the bias, uh, you know, working through um, the sort of the reframe process of just this is not a disability, this is a challenge, and you will tackle it like the other challenges that you, we all have in life. Um, right. At the moment, I'm so curious. So at the moment of diagnosis, when finally a name came through and, and, and the doctor says, you have Parkinson's. What, how did you feel? What was that like for you? Oh, crap. <laughs> yeah. that, that's about all that went through my mind is, oh, crap, I saw this coming. Because mm -hmm. I knew when years before with restless leg and several of the other things, they had put me on Parkinson's medication, but they didn't think it was Parkinson's at the time. They just put me on the medication because that helped one of the issues I was having with sleep and things like that. So it was it was one of those things where it was like it was a blow. But I'm like, okay, I saw that coming. Not what I wanted to hear, but okay, let me think of how I approach this moving forward. And so it took me month, maybe month and a half to kind of move out of the funk I was in of the diagnosis and I, my wife Kelly was basically in the same boat. She was actually, uh, honestly, I think more devastated than I was because she didn't expect it. And I had in the back of my head already said, this is what it is. Mm -hmm. And so when I got through it and I finally said, okay, I'm ready to go fight this thing. It was one of those where it's like, okay, let's turn on the, let's flip the switch and go do it. And immediately within three months, I was training to do a 210 mile ride to raise money for the Michael J. Fox Foundation. And it was something that immediately got me to the point where, okay, I can fight this. I can get in better shape. I can do the things I need to do to delay this, to delay the onset. And if you can tell, I'm not shaking much more than I did in that video in, that was two and a half years ago now. Mm -hmm. so, 2019, almost, yep. yeah, two and a half years. So I'm, I'm not shaking much more than I did then. So I am taking medication that I wasn't then, but at the same time, I am still riding three, three to four times a week. I do approximately 4,000 miles a year on my bicycle. Uh, I raise money for the Michael J. Fox Foundation. I raise money for a number of different organizations that all contribute to hopefully finding a cure for this. Uh, like I said, within my lifetime, that's my goal. That's really inspiring. It's it's really inspiring for me personally. And you know what? What 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 is so what resonates with me, Wayne, is how, as you're telling me your story, repeatedly there there seems to be a theme of, you know, when you know of you going through your valley, but then almost immediately thinking about what can this mean for your daughters, what can this mean for other people fighting this, what can this mean for other people who are struggling, and so there's there's just this recurring theme of you know, just you experiencing your valleys and then almost immediately thinking about what can you do to help other people deal with similar challenges. It, it was very interesting. The first time we played that video at uh, Melissa's uh, uh, keynote opening session at uh, when we were in Madrid, uh, Barcelona, um, I had several people come up to me afterwards and we had long conversations about what they were going through. Uh, we had somebody with uh, major burns uh, that basically disfigured parts and things like that. And uh, another person had uh, a rare form of blood cancer and just people came up to me and we had long conversations and I think I helped them 
in many ways. And just being able to talk about what I've gone through and how I built my team of people that helped me. And that's one of the things that you have to do if you're in a situation like this. You have you can't do this alone. No. You have to do it with a group of people that you trust. And that's everybody from my wife, who I call my head researcher, all the way to my doctor, to a nutritionist, to, and I, I have, you think you'd go to a neurologist for this, but you go to a neurologist with a movement disorder specialty. So they're, as you build your team and as you do what you, as you fight this, you have all these different people you go to. And I even have a PT, a, a physical therapist, that his part of his rehab program was built on cycling. So he he actually said the other day he's going to participate with me in a Michael J. Fox Foundation event that I'm speaking at in a couple uh, in middle of Mar middle of May, and he's going to come on a panel with me, and we're going to talk about how cycling can help um parkinson's patients and how it all fits together and why you'd want to do certain things and this is yeah. that that's it you got to build your team of people that can help you do what you need to do to get where you need to go exactly and you know what 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 you said about uh people coming up to you after watching the video and confiding in you about their own struggles and this is this is one thing that I've seen even in my own experience, which is that when you take the step to be vulnerable about, you know, challenges that 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 we may be facing in our lives, that actually psychologically gives other people the permission to come forward and to also share with you. And in doing so, a community forms. And you talked about the importance of finding the right people to trust right, a community around you. And that is just, that is just the beauty of, you know, being vulnerable, which is it really attracts the people who are wanting to get vulnerable. And then you find that core and you find that trusted community. That is something that I have found to be so critical to my growth as a person. And Wayne, in, in all of our conversations, you have shown me this, you have explicitly said this, that you're a very open and upfront person. Now let, let's talk for a second about, you know, just the fact that you have always been really open about, you know, your Parkinson's disease. And we screened your video to thousands of people within the company. Um, how do you navigate this mental hurdle um, of just being vulnerable and open, especially in environments that sometimes feel risky? To many of us, <laughs> the workplace can sometimes feel risky and it's hard how do you do that well for me it was a matter of i need to if i don't talk about it it doesn't let me be relieved of it almost it's one of those things where it's if i talk about it it's a release for me i can i can help other people i can help me help myself i can be open and honest but at the same time it does it's funny i've nowadays it's really strange because i can cry almost at the drop of a good hallmark commercial <laughs> uh, but at the same time i never used to and now i don't know whether it's the fact i've handed in my man card because i have two daughters uh <laughs> or partially the fact that because i know this disease also does do some different things to your brain and i have friends who have said the same thing it makes you a lot more emotional and just doing that i've found like i said it's a relief for me it helps me do what I like to do is now help people and move the ball forward for this cause. But if I'm not emotional about it, or if I'm not 
open about it, that doesn't help me. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help other people to see that, you know, you, you can be emotional about these things and you can move the ball forward. The one thing that you and I had talked about that I had recently seen, and this is part of the bias thing, was I have friends who have been in in IT for many, many years. One was a CTO of a very large company, and others have been in the tech industry for a long time. But what's happening is when they've left their current company and they go to try to go to another company or go interview or something like that, once they're once they've gotten through a couple interviews or whatever it is, they seem to get I guess there's no good word for it other than ghosted. Mm -hmm. Uh, People seem to go and dig into their backgrounds and find out they may have Parkinson's or something like that where it may not show because I could probably get away by raising my camera up a little and you probably wouldn't notice I'm shaking. But at the same time, when they're on video or something like that, they can get away with through a couple interviews but then you go do that digging and you'll find out that I support Michael J. Fox Foundation. I'm a speaker for them. I do all this and I have Parkinson's and it's out there on YouTube and things like that. And people don't realize that we can add so much still and there's no reason we can't do a job as good or better than anybody else because we have Parkinson's, that's no reason. And we can adapt and many of us, I know for me, it's a challenge to do better than the next guy in my job. Mm -hmm. So that way I can prove that Parkinson's is not slowing me down or can't slow, or I can do whatever anybody else can do plus some Mm -hmm. with Parkinson's. It's a a challenge. And that's, that's how I look at this all the way around. How can I help people get realize employers realize that there's so much more we can give? You know that that bias you talked about in the job search that that's quite frankly discrimination, right? And it's a yeah. real thing. It's a real thing. And so, what advice? I'm, I I I wish I was a fly on the wall when you have these conversations because I'm so curious to to hear about the advice that you would give to others right? Uh, The Parkinson's community around, you know, what should they be saying or doing as they consider revealing that or not to their prospective employers? Well, one of the things that I've found personally is if I'm upfront quick, I'll get to the point. Uh, I'll get to an end state, either they're going to want to talk to me more or they're not going to want to talk to me more. And why drag it out further than I need to or why drag it out further than you need to? If you can, on the other hand, if you can hide it for a couple of years, if you know that, you know, if I take my medication when I want to take my medication and, you know, I'm regimented about it and I don't shake and things like that, then yeah, some people aren't comfortable about revealing it. But for me, I prefer not to take any medication, personally. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, side effects are not fun. But at the same time, I need to be upfront. I need to say, look, I can do this. I can do that. I can kick anybody's ass I go up against for the same role. But I have Parkinson's. So there you go. How do you want to handle it? And that's uh we've been kicking ass at Sousa, I can say that for sure. <laughs> I try. <laughs> um thank you for thank you for sharing that perspective. Now just shifting gears a little bit, going back to the video that we saw, it was really fun to hear about how your favorite engagement, you've done a lot of speaking engagements, but that your favorite has been I'm um, speaking at your daughter's fourth and sixth grade classes. Um, yeah. kids, are, kids are amazing. They're curious, they're unfiltered, 
and oh. sometimes that honesty can be refreshing, right? My daughter is two, turns two next month. She's starting to speak. So now her thoughts actually are verbalized and I can tell <laughs> you it's getting interesting. Um, so Wayne, I'm, I'm curious. So let's start with the first part of the question, which is what was the, what were the types of questions that, you know, these kids were asking you that made it so just your favorite engagement? Just the fact that they're so open and honest about everything they ask. And it was a matter of, you know, are you going to die? No, I'm not going to die. This is not going to kill me. There are going to be issues along the way, but this is that. And they said they asked a lot of questions because I talk about cycling a lot and I talk about uh, nutrition a lot and things like that. And so they got into a lot of things like, why do you bike so much? Why is it, why is it good for you? Well, it's just exercise in general is what it's good. And I talk about exercise and I talk about how to adapt to things. And that's the kids really love to see how you tackle problems. Children are curious and that's, that's one of their biggest things. So how did you, how do you keep your feet on the pedals? when you're when you're cycling and most of them haven't done a lot of cycling and right. you know your feet are actually locked in to the pedals in well in some cases depending upon the style bike you ride things like that how do you do that how do you hold on to the handlebar when your hand shakes so bad you know different things like that how do you adapt to do this or how do you one of the things is uh i always laugh but this is an analogy I'll use for this group rather than the sixth graders, but I go to the bar and grab a beer for my wife and I, and I come back with a beer and a half. You know, how do you, how do you adapt to do this? You ask for help often. And you, you, like I said earlier, you have your team and you make sure you ask for help. And so for me, I'll carry two beers in one hand or I'll say, Hey, hold that beer i'll be back and grab it in a second or you know whatever it may be things like that are the kids are curious how do you drive like that or how, you know there are a lot of different things they ask that are just mind-blowing in many cases it's like wow i never thought of that but uh i can't think of anything off the top of my head specific questions they ask but uh like I said, they're so open. They're so honest. They're they just want to understand what's going on. And I believe that kids mm. are more open and honest and curious than most adults. And uh, yeah, it's it's been interesting. Actually, one of the one of the neat uh, presentations I did was to Novartis. Uh, Novartis is a big drug company. And I presented in their auditorium and they had 80 scientists sitting in that room in the auditorium. And then they had another 30 over in Sweden or something or Switzerland or something like that piped in via video. And these guys know so much more about the disease than I ever will because they're trying to develop a drug for it and everything. But what they didn't understand was what a day in the life of a Parkinson's patient looks like. And so when they're trying to design a drug, they're like, okay, I understand now what that's like or as close as they can come to it. And it makes for really interesting conversations when you get into somebody in with somebody too that is so much more in the know of the disease than yeah. you but yeah. they don't understand the daily ins and outs of the disease that's truly intriguing isn't it when we when we find ourselves just in the weeds of things we get into the minutiae of things sometimes we miss the big picture which is what is the experience for the person right or what is the life story of that person and, and what are the real emotions of this person so you're right i feel like you know as as adults we have a lot to learn in terms of just you know the curiosity and the authenticity that children bring in their lines of questions. So yep. 
with that, I, I guess, you know, for adults like myself as a colleague to you, how should we be approaching you and the Parkinson's community uh, to come alongside you if we have questions or if we're curious about it? Okay. Um, probably the best thing that anybody can do for a Parkinson's patient themselves is just be helpful. Like I said, if I'm going to the counter to or the bar to grab beer, or if you're with somebody who has Parkinson's, just to ask them, hey, can I grab that for you? It's the little things that make life easier for somebody like myself. So if I don't have to grab, you know, if I get three beers, I can't do three beers, but I can do two. So, you know, it's the little things that help. It's uh Right now, I'm, my wife cringes every time, but uh, I'm building cabinets upstairs for our laundry room. And when I use power tools, she cringes <laughs> because, you know, me cutting a straight line right now is not an easy thing because I'm right handed. <laughs> so she says she comes out and she'll help me out or I'll have the kids help me out, whatever. My kids right now know how to use a table saw and a and a band saw and other things like that because I asked them to help. And that's one of the things, like I said, develop the team, develop the people around you that you can trust that will say, hey, let me grab that for you. Let me do this. But for the Parkinson's community itself, one of the best things you can do is participate. Uh, I form a team every year for uh, the New England Parkinson's Ride, which is a, uh, a ride that all of the proceeds go to the Michael J. Fox Foundation. And we raise almost, well, the past couple of years, we've raised more than $1.5 million to go directly to research for the Michael J. Fox Foundation from this ride. So the ride ranges anywhere from 10 to 30 to 60 to 100. And we do 100 miles. I put together a team every year and we go out and we do 100 miles. Not everybody does the 100, but we all start off with the intent of doing it. And so over the past couple of years, uh, I think for that ride in particular, we raised my small team of five people. I think we raised $15,000 for the Michael J. Fox Foundation this wow. year. We've already, I've already put out feelers and I've already had people start to sign up for the team and the race or the ride isn't even until September 10th this year. Um, we're going to have a team close to 10 to hopefully 12 people. And with that many people, I think we can raise hopefully $20,000 or more. Congratulations. And, I mean, that's amazing. That's a great goal to have. Yeah, uh, those are the types of things that if you if you're a runner, feel free to jump in. If you're one of the things, Zelia Maglioza, who's uh, in our HR team, uh, I was able to get her a bib for the uh, uh, New York Marathon. Uh, so she was able to run for my team and raise money for my team. And anybody who wants to contribute or who is a runner, I can often get bibs to a lot of the major marathons because Michael J. Fox Foundation is generally a sponsor of some sort or another for those things, uh, basically in the charity side. So please feel free if you want to come forward, join a team, do some riding with us, whatever it might be. We also do, a, other than the one in Maine, we do the 212 mile one in New York, where yeah. we leave from cent Central Park and go up to uh, Schenectady, New York to Union College. And uh, so we get a lot well, of support happens, for that one too. What happens to people like me, the non-athletic sort? <laughs> I mean, I work out, but you know, I, you can't put me in a marathon. I, I, would, I would fall over in two seconds flat, but you know, just what are some of the things virtually, I'm not in, I mean, I'm in Seattle, you're in Boston, right? Yep. Uh, 
I I want to get my hands on practically supporting, you know, colleagues like yourself. Like, do you have do you have any ideas as to what would be the most effective way for us to do that? Well, I would love to put together a virtual event for the Michael J. Fox Foundation for SUSE. And we could do something as simple as uh, I've seen bowling events uh, done online. I've seen uh, cycling events, of course. Uh, there are a number of things we could look at building within SUSE to support the community. And I would love to uh, love to do that. Wonderful, wonderful. It's, it's, it's really cool to be thinking about all the different dimensions and the ways that we can come alongside uh, you and the Parkinson's community. Now, you've mentioned the Michael J. Fox Foundation a few times, and I know that you are such an avid supporter of this specific organization. Can you tell us a little bit more about this organization and, and why you're so passionate about, about them? Absolutely. Uh, one of the reasons that they're really the organization I support, there are several others, Davis Fitty Foundation, Brian Grant Foundation, the uh, Parkinson's Foundation itself. There are several that are great, great groups, but the Michael J. Fox Foundation has set up uh, where their athletes, uh, anybody who signs up as an athlete for them on a team or whatever it might be, 100% of every dollar they raise goes to uh, research. And that's the only way we're gonna find a cure is through that research so if i can for every dollar i raise that 15 to twenty thousand dollars whatever it is that i go out and raise for that michael j fox foundation i know it's going to research mm. and to me that makes that makes all the difference in the world they get a lot of corporate donations due to michael j fox his name and how he runs his organization as well they have an amazingly well put together organization that uh, the CFO has literally been there from the day of inception. And one of Michael J. Fox's goals is to basically shut down the organization. Hmm. As soon as he finds a cure, the organization is gone. That's what he's there for. And that's what that group is there for is to just find a cure. And to me, that's about as close to my heart as you can get. <laughs> that is so thoroughly mission focused and so transparent. I, I, I totally understand why you will be so passionate. Um, well, I guess we're almost at time for q and I could go on and on, um, but I will, um, I will go into my last question before Jenny comes on, which is, a tie into earlier what you said, which came from a tie into uh, something that you said earlier, which is the whole notion of, you know, just being emotional and that being a part of being vulnerable, even in work settings. I mean, can we can we just talk about how emo the term emotional has such a bad rap in the workplace and that, you know, why like why can't we normalize actually being emotional and actually being human? um at work because you know work is such a part of life it's not a separate and distinct part of life so that area of just normalizing emotions that is a prerequisite to to vul being vulnerable at work is really meaningful to me knowing what you know today about being free with your emotions i'm curious to hear about what would you say to yourself those 20 years ago um before your diagnosis well, one of the things I would say is just be patient. Uh, you'll it. Everything comes around sooner or later, and when you're more emotional and you emote, you you get understanding. You get understanding, and you get the you get people wanting to help because emotion means that you're, to me, emotion means you're ready to ask somebody for help and you're ready to receive that help. And that's one of the things that 
I believe through work is something that we can all get better at is how can I help you do better at your role or do better at whatever you want to do. And I think that's being emotional brings that capability or brings that openness that most places don't have and if i can say look i'm i'm really frustrated about this whatever i'm doing can you help is there anything you can do to get me over that hump and that's one of the one of the things we all need to understand is that you can't do everything yourself and you need to be able to ask for help and just that ability to ask for help is something that makes you more vulnerable. Words to live by. Wayne, thank you. Thank you so much. You have brought your whole self into this conversation. You've inspired me to think so differently about so many things, uh, especially with you know the way that I interact at work. So thank you for inspiring me and thank you for inspiring everybody who tuned in today. Um, and with that, I see that Jenny is on. Jenny, I'm gonna get off camera, uh, but you know, let me know if, the, if if I can help or chime in or anything. But I, time is yours, Wayne, for the Q and A. Thank you, April, and we definitely will call you back on for a, a stint, April. Wayne, I hope you'll indulge and be so kind as to indulge myself and the audience with allowing me to read one of the comments we've had. Um, and I, okay. I'll start by saying that it's a it's a member of our extended team here at SUSE, and you've had them in tears, and I'll, I'll, re I'll read what they said. They said, I didn't know my mom before her disabilities, and as a young child, I remember feeling so alone at times, and that other children did not understand what it would be like to have a different parent. I have to say, you speaking at your children's school and sharing your story about being different is incredible. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, that that touched me. And when I read that comment, Wayne, um, I have to say that I had, didn't even notice the um, author of the comment. And then when I realized it was somebody that I knew, it touched me even more. So I think just having this conversation is just so powerful. So I, I, I couldn't not share that comment. I think it's just so <laughs> that we have these conversations and that we we open up because we, we never quite know as we talked about earlier yourself and april what people may be experiencing but with that i'm going to actually follow up on that comment with our first question and it's actually related to that so the question that um we have here is you talked about in your video speaking with your children's class how did you navigate the conversation with your children when you were diagnosed and in particular, what advice would you give for other parents who have to have these difficult conversations? There are a lot of resources out there for people to talk to their children, people to talk to other adults, people to talk to HR at work. Um, a lot of these resources do exist and I'm always here for anybody at SUSE to talk to, to bounce ideas off of, whatever it may be. Uh, but the key things that are out there, uh, I read through one of the Michael J. Fox Foundation documents on how to talk to your children and how to tell them what Parkinson's is and about it. And that part of that inspired me to be the one to go to talk to the schools because there are so many people out there right now that are diagnosed with Parkinson's or their aunt or uncle or father or mother or grandmother or grandfather have Parkinson's that a lot of people don't understand it. And that's part of what I wanted to do and in, in going out there. And like I said, breaking the bias and saying, look, it's, you know, it's not gonna kill you, but at the same time, just learn how to ask for help or learn how to go find the proper team to handle this. And like I said, the resources are 
online if anybody needed anything or want to wanted to talk through a relative's diagnosis on Parkinson's or wanted me to talk to a relative, I'm always willing to do that. This is something I've done for so many people and it's something I enjoy doing because I want to make sure that people don't go curl up in a corner and die and take this as a death sentence. It's not that. So. Thank you, Wayne. Um, we had a question here and I'll, I'll read it actually rather than trying to paraphrase it because again I think a lot of what you're saying is resonating with people and their own experiences. So someone has said here, um, Wayne you mentioned that the doctors didn't believe you when you talked about your, your symptoms and you know you suspected your own diagnosis quite early on and many women are often overlooked when trying to get health care in the US. And it's so easy that you start doubting yourself and thinking maybe I'm just a hypochondriac. But how did you have the courage to keep going and to push to get that diagnosis? Well, like I said, mine became obvious uh, shortly after, shortly in uh, July of 2017 when I started shaking. Because what that is, is that means there are two parts in the brain that control dopamine production, and they're called the basal ganglia. Basal ganglia produce dopamine. Dopamine helps you control muscle movement, et cetera, et cetera. And for me, it finally got to the point where when I was shaking, that was a clear sign that something is seriously wrong. So what they did was they then ran me through a PET scan, an MRI, and some other physical testing and blood testing and everything like that to make sure that first there was nothing else wrong. And then once they did the PET scan with the part of nuclear medicine, they're able to light up the basal ganglia and look at the difference between the two. And when they were able to do that, they said, oh, that's a clear sign that you have this so for me it was it was all of a sudden very clear because they were able to see it you're able to see it on a screen and know that this is what it is so how did i deal with it beforehand like i said it was frustrating it was very difficult to get to a point where anybody would believe me and like i said when they crushed the femoral nerve I was in constant pain for a while, and that, like I said, led to other things. But the only way through it is to just put your head down and keep going and work with people and try to figure it out. It's, it's a puzzle. It really is. Oh, thank you, Wayne. I'm sure that will help those that you know, also have to sort of fight to get their voice heard because it's not always easy, especially when you're dealing with the medical profession or any other profession that, you know, they're the ones that know or should know everything and you're trying to get your voice heard. I've got another uh, interesting question here and there are so many interesting questions. And this one, I, I echo what this person says. So they've said, Wayne, I'm incredibly inspired by what you said. Now that I know the fight, I'm all in. How do you apply this in your everyday work as well? And April, just to tee you up, the other part of the question is, and April, is there a motto that you live by? So Wayne, if you wanna just tell us a little bit more about that. <laughs> Probably my, my biggest motto is adapt and overcome, uh, which, is marine, uh, which is a marine motto too. Uh, one of the things I do to adapt and overcome is like I said, I do, uh, I have devices I test, I measure everything. Um, my previous, my education, I'm an engineer, but, and that means things to me run in data. So I take data, everything from my, I measure everything from the pedal pressure on my bike in wattage. So I know with my, if my right leg is applying less pressure than my left. I know when medications affect me 
and the timing I need to do before the medications. Like I said, it's all about data for me and it's all about adapting and overcoming and doing what I need to do this. My wife calls it playing whack-a-mole. And uh, as a symptom comes up, do what I can to whack it and settle it back down and go about my business and be able to do everything I need and want to do. April? I, know, <laughs> I was gonna say, I know there's someone else here, Wayne, that's really keen on data, not mentioning any names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Jenny, Jenny gets terrorized every 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 quarter about data, but Jenny is such a good sport. Um, Wayne, this is so good. Um, you know, Jenny, my the mo a, a motto that I live by is I have a lot, and the main one that I constantly come back to is just the the whole notion of uh, leaving things better than when you found them. I really believe in that. I really believe in you know. If somebody has encountered you as a person, as a manager, as a colleague, if somebody has encountered you as a person, or if you're a part of a community, or if you're at work, or if you're, you know, working through your valleys, the thing that really inspires me and takes me out of my shadow self when I'm triggered is the whole notion of how can I leave this better than when I first found it? Right. And this is also the thread that so I have with a lot I, when I think about the people that I really look up to, people like Wayne, um, that 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 is a that is a theme that bubbles to the surface as to why, you know, they they have my respect and admiration. It's because there's a common thread of, you know, seeking to be to leave things better than when they found them. Wayne is doing everything that he can to attack the disease and to help people who are struggling with it find ways to cope with it better. And so I think, you know, Wayne, like this is this is this is an easy one for me to answer because in listening to you, sitting at this, sitting at the at, 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 at you know, just at this table and listening to you, it's it's really been the one thing that's you know kind of at the back of my mind and how you have been really doing that and how much this mantra really, really means to me. It reinforces that. That's awesome. That makes me feel good. <laughs> Inspiring from both of you, Wayne. And I'm I'm watching an eye on the clock as always, Wayne. We always have so many more questions that we can answer. And I think with that in mind, what would your final words be to the audience today in terms of breaking the bias when we think about how we interact with people that are experiencing various difficulties and challenges in their life from the perspective that you have experienced? First of all, consider what people are going through. Uh, a disability may not be considered a disability to them. Uh, for me, it's not a disability, it's a challenge for daily life. And how do I overcome it? How do I adapt to it? Things like that. And for everyone out there, this is the way to, to deal with things is be upfront. And I, you know, I, I can't get it out of my mind that I don't understand why people don't attack things like I do, but I do understand it after, I, I didn't understand it at first, now I understand it. People get to the point where they're overwhelmed and just don't get overwhelmed. Take a step back, think about it, figure out, figure out the problem, figure out the puzzle, and then figure out the best way to go attack the issues and be your, be your own best advocate. Form that team around you and go kick its ass. That's about the only way I could. I, I love the last statement, Wayne. I won't repeat it. I think I can't deliver it as great <laughs> as you. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. I think we could have easily filled another hour. April, thank you so much for hosting Wayne and for also giving us your perspective. A shout out for April's blog on Sousa.com. We've got two more <laughs> events coming up. The details are in the blog. Um, I hope to be able to join you all next week for the final two events. So with that, 
we'll say goodbye and thanks again Wayne and thanks again April and thank you to the audience for joining us today. Thank you, Wayne and thank you so much Jenny. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you everyone. I appreciate it and appreciate the comments I've seen come through. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.